Module 8 Relational Summary Lecture GNP2, Must We Choose? As I write this, we are at a crossroads politically. We have some politicians, very few here in the United States, unfortunately, on the science side of a dangerous and artificial dichotomy. And we have many, many more in Europe who understand that climate disruption is an existential threat, a threat to the existence of most of us, if not the richest few. And then we have other politicians, unfortunately, in places where the wealthiest elites have subverted democratic rule, who tell us that it is a hoax or a reality not anthropogenic in origin and thus not under our control, which we must simply adapt to and good luck to you. But let's examine that binary position for a second. It makes for great political theater, but is it true? Are these really the only two choices we face, believe it or not? Are the choices so dichotomous that you could cut them with a knife? Choosing how to respond to climate disruption isn't at all like choosing a political candidate or group in this absurd two-party football club of a political system. There are other choices than the ones sung about in Annie Get Your Gun. For me, it's all or nothing. It's all or nothing for me. You don't have to accept that humans are the cause of climate change to work actively on mitigating it, for example. Let's suppose, for the sake of argument, that climate change was not anthropogenic. Let's suppose that we humans had nothing to do with it, that it was and is the result of shifts in the Earth's magnetic field, or sunspots and solar flux, or the sudden appearance of massive mountain ranges where the Earth is now flat. An idea with great appeal to the wrong Biblican folks who think the Earth is both flat and only 6,000 years old, or the sudden subduction of mountains where ranges now exist due to the catastrophic earthquakes depicted in apocalypse, in apocalypse movies like 2012 which, in case you don't remember, didn't turn out to be such a bad year after all. Would we then be forced to choose adaptation to the crisis just because it seemed like an act of God? Is that how we react to so-called natural disasters now? Do we just wait for tornadoes or hurricanes to flatten our houses? Do we wait for fires to burn them down? Do we let ourselves slowly freeze to death as winter approaches or die of heat exhaustion as the summer swelter begins? Do we let ourselves die of thirst when the drought comes? No. We prepare and we try to mitigate. We invent. We try out new technologies all the time. HVAC systems, running water and water towers and aquifers and cisterns, rainwater catchment, motors, engines, electricity, pumps, vehicles, hell, clothes, shelters, solar panels, pencils and paper, typewriters, radio, television. Everything that culture has ever evolved to make our microclimate safer and more stable and hospitable for the majority of us around the world. We also have always tried to change the climate for the good. That's what housing was all about at the local climate level. And every species does that. Termites and ants and bees even create vast air conditioning systems that take advantage of convection currents and artificial arthropodogenic because they're arthropods, arthropodogenic wind made by the strategic beating of wings. That's what many animals do and certainly something we humans do and have done long before our impact had much of an impact. So why do we act as though macro climate change is any different? Why do we have to accept it? Since when do humans, much less beavers and bees, take whatever nature throws at us? Let's suppose also that fossil fuels had nothing to do with climate change so far and that we could do what we like with them. Well, the first thing a smart group of humans would do, homo sapiens being the wise people, is say, regardless of what we have done in the past and whether it has, has had anything to do with a gradually warming planet, this is getting rather uncomfortable and dangerous. And since there's a definite correlation between the amount of infrared radiation trapping gases in the atmosphere and the amount of infrared radiation trapped within the biosphere, the last thing we want to do is add more heat-trapping gases to the air, right, gents? That would be step one, wouldn't it? No blame has to be assigned for the past, but uh, hey, would, 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 why would you exacerbate the problem? I mean, imagine that you're in your living room on a sweltering day, hot through no fault of your own, and your little brother comes in and closes all the windows, turns on all the incandescent bulbs in the house, opens the shades in the sun-drenched living room, puts a black carpet down on the floor, and drapes a black blanket on the couch, and then starts cooking on a four-burner stove without turning on the venting fan, and then comes into the living room and turns on the big screen TV and starts playing a kickboxing game on the Xbox Kinect. Would you accept that behavior? 
Or would you say, hey, dumpster, that's really stupid. Stop adding heat to the house. We're burning up in here. And suppose he said, well, it's not my fault that it's hot outside. And it was getting hotter inside before I even got home. So basically, I should be able to do whatever I want. But does, doesn't that sound stupid? And what if you said to him, but, but you're letting light in through the living room windows, which is hitting the black surfaces you just laid over everything and turning into heat, which can't get out of the windows because of the well-known greenhouse effect. It's the same thing that makes our car seat get so hot on a sunny but cold winter's day when the windows are all rolled up. It's what makes the damn greenhouse a greenhouse. The glass house where we keep our plants it keeps it warm all winter because light turns into heat, you idiot. And on top of that, you're burning stuff in the house, burning calories and sweating and exhaling here in the living room and burning gas on the stove. What the hell? Could you at least close the blinds and turn out the overhead lamps and maybe open the windows? See, that is what's going on with planet Earth right now. And the politics of it are that just like your whiny little brother who doesn't know better or doesn't want to know better, some people just want to do what they want to do with no regard for the consequences. Irresponsible. Because as soon as he's eaten the pasta he's making and finished his workout, he's going out with his friends to the air-conditioned mall, leaving you to swelter in the heat that he added to through his actions. The politics of climate change are really the politics of irresponsibility. At this point, it doesn't really matter so much who or what caused global warming, does it? I mean, that's a matter for historians, really. What matters is that we stop adding heat to our home planet, that we draw down the carbon, which is like drawing down the shades, in a sense, or like opening the windows to let heat out, and that we cool down the house by removing the heat-absorbing surfaces, getting rid of black and gray pavement and roofing, painting it white or bright colors, covering it with vegetation to absorb the sunlight instead, transforming into food and carbon-sequestering woody tissue and soil instead of heat, getting the reflective ice and snow and permafrost back in place to throw the sunlight back up where it came from instead of sucking it into the blue-black ocean where it radiates throughout as heat. The engineering of this is really very simple, technologically, as we said in the last lecture, and only politically difficult. Most of the solutions don't have any ecological downsides at all. I'm reminded of this great climate cartoon that I'm sure, or at least I hope, you've all seen. A speaker at the climate summit is presenting all the carbon drawdown solutions and sustainable development goals solutions, you know, energy independence, preserve rainforests, sustainability, green jobs, livable cities, renewables, clean water and air, healthy children, etc., etc. And a skeptic in the audience complains, what if it's a big hoax and we create a better world for nothing? That picture says it all. Almost everything we talk about in things like the conversation about what should be added to a Green New Deal would be, notable, would, be, would be notably laudable without the existential threat of climate change. There really is no reason not to embrace and implement these solutions in and of themselves. They all lead to a better world by almost every objective measure except that used by beneficiaries of the socio-politico-economic status quo. Pundits of power will argue that using fossil fuels has and could continue to lift people out of poverty. But there again, we face a false dichotomy. Nexus thinkers aren't falling for the binary use them or lose them mantra, exploit them all or keep them in the ground. Nexus thinkers are saying, look, we can't afford to put more carbon compounds in the atmosphere. So why don't we use the great gift of fossil fuels in such a way that no CO2 is released into the atmosphere? That's easy to do. You just don't expose fossil carbon to direct atmospheric combustion at a rate greater than terrestrial vegetation and aquatic plankton and algae and cyanobacteria can pull it out and fix it. Doesn't mean you can't use the carbon. You just don't burn it unless you have to. And when you do, you ensure that an equivalent amount gets pulled back out of the atmosphere. Duh. Clever Nobel Prize winning economists going back to Kenneth Boulding and Herman Daly have argued about the need to create a steady state economy, what they call a spaceship economy or spaceman, spacewoman economy, instead of a cowboy economy. When they wrote about this steady state over half a century ago, 
they didn't mean stagnant. They really meant one where economic growth didn't grow the amount of pollution on the land and the rivers and lakes, the streams and seas, and in the atmosphere. They posited a world where a circular economy was growing instead, a zero waste economy where the circle kept growing, eventually into outer space where the truest spaceship economy would have to prevail. Greenhouse gases, you see, are waste. They represent wasted materials and wasted opportunities. Carbon and nitrogen not fixed in soil and food and methane not decomposed into the carbon cycle part of the life cycle are horrendous deadweight losses to society that unfortunately are just light enough to make it up to the stratosphere where they act like that window in the living room. But the answer is really simple. As even a young Greta Thunberg has repeatedly said during the worldwide political protest she started, the Fridays for Future, protests where school kids skipped school on Fridays every week to say to their teachers and parents, y'all have been teaching us completely wrong stuff. You lied to us. You've misrepresented facts. You've hidden solutions. And we hold you responsible. And we want to reform the education system around solutions, not problems. In fact, here's a picture of me attending one of those protests with my son in Germany a couple of years ago. He and his generation get it. Greta's right answer to the exam question, how do you keep global warming from getting worse, was simply don't put any more greenhouse gases in our air and then draw them down. That's it. Done. Easy peasy. But politically, it pissed a lot of people off. When I was in Poland, however, I managed to get some press attention on one part of the solution. And though it was so simple, the newspapers in Krakow called me a genius. All I said was, I understand that there are two sides fighting right now in Poland. On the one hand, you have the labor groups who are employed in the coal sector and depend on coal mining and processing to survive economically. And on the other hand, you have the tech groups and service economy and academics and scientists and public health officials and doctors who are pushing for renewables and who want to keep the coal in the ground. Not just because of the climate effects, but because of the lung disease and the smog that coal creates. Now these two groups are fighting each other tooth and nail. And we're also learning that the goal of clean coal is elusive because it takes two units of coal energy in to get one unit of clean coal energy out. Cleaning coal is energy intensive sequestering the carbon molecules, both the toxic compounds and soot and smog and CO2, takes energy and costs money. But I would like to respectfully submit that you could invest now in solar and wind and other renewables using the money you would save on health costs and lost work days and clean up of soot damaged surfaces, etc. And then use the clean power they generate to clean up the coal operation. So you would use two units of renewable energy in to get one unit of clean coal energy out. Doesn't that sound like a win-win? You could easily clean up your dirty brown coal that way for domestic use, using the clean coal to jumpstart a methanol economy and take your already cleaner anthracite coal and continue to export it for hard currency, but power the domestic sector with solar hot water and photovoltaics and geothermal and wind and heat pumps and dimethyl ether and thermal depolarization and biogas, et cetera, et cetera, so that the cities would be spotlessly clean with fresh, healthy air to breathe. How does that sound? And I guess it sounded good enough, or I was a good enough politician in the way I sold the idea, that the newspaper called me this climate professor genius from USF. Very flattering. But at the end of the day, it just goes back to common sense nexus thinking and a rejection of the binary either or logic, an embrace of the postmodern both and. It's a philosophy born of faith. It comes from a belief that we have more solutions than problems, and that we can always find a way to see good triumph over bad. You see, the politics of the North are a confused set of politics that emerged from a clash of many cultures, a clash of many ideologies that all came together in what emerged as centers of commerce and power. At its best, the Enlightenment experiments that we forged from the Magna Carta and the Iroquois Confederacy, the Iroquois Confederacy among others, uh, and the Declaration of Independence and the American Constitution created a politics of inclusion and democracy, an e pluribus unum, where a diversity of ideas were freely debated until the best emerged. Win-win was the ethos, and a faith in some kind of good, loving, supportive, natural, or spiritual force permeated the politics. 
At its worst, the North produced fascism, a politics of competitive exclusion and oligarchy, of social Darwinism, where only the fittest, those most ready to adapt because of inherited wealth and privilege, prevail, and where we suffer the rule of the few over the many. The pluralistic moments in our politics saw us striving to learn from everyone and striving to make, every, make sure that everyone had a chance to learn. The totalitarianism moments have seen us dictating to people what to do and how to do it, and totalitarians seek total control over resources, over food and energy and water. As Lord Acton famously said, power tends to corrupt and absolute power corrupts absolutely. But what if we used energetic power as our metaphor and applied it to political power? What would happen if we switched to clean energy, to clean power? Could we then say clean power tends to improve and absolutely clean power improves absolutely? Could the end of dirty power help end dirty politics? Given the amount of power and filth fossil fuels have generated ecologically and politically, the chances seem pretty good. Centralized power, power that can be controlled by the few because of its concentrated form, and easy to store and easy to control fossil liquid solids and highly compressed gases, tends to concentrate political power. Decentralized electrical or transportation or industrial or domestic power also tends to decentralize political control. It lends itself much better to the maintenance of a democracy. One of the issues that climate politics needs to tackle is the difference between a democracy and a republic and what that means for climate policy. And at the same time, what decentralized renewable energy sources mean not just for climate mitigation and pollution abatement, but for decentralizing governance. The United States, we must remember, is not an Athenian democracy where every citizen gets an equal vote. De Tocqueville and many of our founding fathers were against any democratic process that could lead to the tyranny of the majority or mob rule. Instead, we created a republic that is a representative democracy in the hopes that experienced, well-educated people would represent their competing constituencies to hammer out policies that worked for the vast majority of us, that worked for the greater good, not just the winning side. Politics was supposed to use Hegelian dialectics and Socratic dialogue to work out the best compromises which would always be subject to further revision and refinement. And remember that revision really means to keep exploring options with improved vision. You will find when you explore Drawdown that many of the climate solutions in the book really are political solutions based on giving more voice and agency to others who had been left out of the concentrated, centralized inner circle. Now, solution number six in our book, Educating Girls, is something no representative democracy can survive without. It improves the economy so much that the book doesn't even list a cost for it, and it's said to have the potential to reduce CO2 by 59.6 gigatons. They say, quote, across low-income countries, there's a strong link between women and the natural systems at the heart of family and community life. Women often and increasingly play roles as stewards and managers of food, soil, trees, and water. As educated girls become educated women, they confuse inherited traditional knowledge with new information accessed through the written word. A 2013 study found that educating girls is the single most important social and economic factor associated with the reduction in vulnerability to natural disasters. The single most important, they emphasize." End quote. And of course, it ties directly in with family planning, drawdown solution number seven, empowering women and girls to be in charge of family planning, something patriarchal politics in the US, if not the rest of the North, is bringing under fire at present. But it's estimated to reduce CO2 by 59.6 gigatons. As for the cost, the book declares, quote, it is inappropriate to monetize a human right, end quote. Now, less well understood when it comes to women's rights, drawdown solution number 62 with data too variable to be determined in terms of cost is enabling women smallholders, that is, giving women the political right to control what happens to the land. This is said to cause yield per plots in small agriculture to rise by 26% and is estimated to be able to reduce carbon by 2.06 gigatons by 2050. And then there are solutions that work for both men and women alike, but really have done more to benefit women than any other group. And one of those is drawdown number 59, improving bike infrastructure, 
estimated to reduce carbon by 2.31 gigatons at a net cost of negative $2 trillion with a net savings of $400 billion. And this is about much more than the cost. Your textbook states, quote, the bicycle has been an agent of change since it first rolled into 19th century Europe as a leisure item for sporty men. Within a matter of years, cycling became widespread, widely accessible, and widely loved. Bikes allowed adolescents to mix and mingle across neighborhoods and social classes away from moralizing eyes. They gave women freedom of movement and helped redefine norms of dress and femininity. As suffragist Susan B. Anthony said in 1896, quote, let me tell you what I think of bicycling. I think it has done more to emancipate women than anything else in the world, end quote. Given that there are still countries like Saudi Arabia where women are not allowed to drive cars, and many where poverty makes the possibility of a woman driving a car remote to impossible, a better bike infrastructure everywhere not only is a climate solution, but a political empowerment solution, providing access to markets and education and tools and opportunities. It is listed as drawdown solution number 59, taking out an estimated 2.31 gigatons of CO2 at a cost of negative $2 trillion with a net savings of $400 billion. See, the best drawdown solutions are, of course, those that create multiplier effects, simultaneously providing ecological and political benefits that help us create cultures and ecosystems that are robust and resilient and inclusive. Indigenous peoples' land management, solution number 39, drawing down 6.19 gigatons of CO2, saving a whopping 849 gigatons of carbon through protection of the carbon-rich forests and soils and biomes of indigenous people, is another one of those triple bottom line win-win solutions. By politically empowering people who've been kept at the margins and being ever more inclusive, we can turn the tide of climate change. See what other solutions that influence both the technosphere and the biosphere and the cultural sphere you can find. Often one choice expands another. The truth is that once we're free from fossil fuels and their imposed hegemony, our markets can finally be free, freed from the grip of petrodictators and oligarchies, both foreign and domestic, filled with options and alternatives that can empower women and minorities and diverse communities and municipalities with their unique and overlapping bioregional clean power products and services. A new, gentler form of microcapitalist social entrepreneurship becomes possible with free trading of technologies and ideas. Instead of you being for or against one party or another, we can all be party to a renaissance of human enterprise that fulfills all three pillars of sustainability, economic, social, and environmental, with profits and dividends accruing from the drawdown of carbon and nitrogen out of the atmosphere and back into production cycles in our new north circular economy of industrial ecology. There's so many ways to get there, and we can all play a part. So as you can see, the choices are anything but binary.